All right, well, let's go on and get started. I know people are going to continue to trickle in and that is great. So, my name is Kristen kid and I'm with the Southeast prevention technology transfer center and we'd like to welcome you today to part 1 of a 3 part series on um, alcohol policies. And today we're going to be focusing on the why, why alcohol policies, a community approach to reduce community harms. So, so uh, this training is 100% supported by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, you need to know that the views expressed in today's training do not necessarily represent the views, policies, positions of SAMHSA, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, or the US government. The webinar is being recorded. You are live right now, and it will be available on our website. Um, yes, please do put your put your name and where you're from in the chat. We'd love to know where everybody's from. Um, when everybody comes in, you are muted, but you will be um, asked to raise your hand at some point during the day if you'd like to actually voice a comment um, instead of just writing it in the chat. But those will 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 let you know when that time comes. So we have one more disclaimer to make, and that's on the next slide. So uh, we are we are collaborating today with the Center for Advancing Alcohol Science to Practice, and their project is supported by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, they are 100% funded by the CDC and the Department of Health and Human Services. And just like the, the disclaimer I made for SAMHSA, uh, the contents that are going to be expressed by the authors today don't necessarily represent the views of the CDC, HHS, or the U.S. government as well. So we just got to get all those little disclaimers in. So today um, we will be inviting you to chat, uh, and you will see that on the right side of your screen. For those of you, if, if you're on an iPad, it might look different, and I'm sorry, I don't really know what that looks like. Um, but the, the chat, you've got a couple different tabs on the right. You've got participants, and you will go there when it's time for us to start a breakout. We will have breakouts today, but you can also select chat, and that's where you can chat. And when you do chat, please select everyone so that everyone hears your great ideas. So after the webinar, um, our funder requires an evaluation. It's a 10-question evaluation form. Um, you will automatically be sent to that when you close out. And you may see something about danger, danger, you're going to an external site. It's okay, you're just going to complete um, the, they call it the GIPRA or the evaluation. And from there, you will also be invited to participate in a, in a post survey um, that you'll find in REDCap. And that one's very specific to us at Wake Forest. We really wanna know if we are um, meeting the needs and we are providing the right information to, to the participants today. So we do appreciate whatever you can do to complete those. Um, you will be, you will have access to the PowerPoint slides and of course, yes, the certificate of attendance. Um, I will send out an email with all of that information a day or two after the, today's session. Okay, so the, the PTTC network um, really believes in being inclusive and really that begins with the words that we use because words, um, words have power and we really believe in putting people first and we really strive to use affirming language in all that we do so that everyone feels welcome. So the PTTC network, I'm sure everyone on this call is pretty darn familiar with the PTTC network now. Um, but there are 10 regions across the U.S. and they're color coded here. We're located in the southeast. If you click again, it might circle the southeast. We the, the southeast PTTC is housed at Wake Forest School of Medicine and Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And we serve eight states here in the southeast region. Um, if you don't live in the southeast region, don't worry. There is a PTTC network for you. Um, and you can find that by going to pttcnetwork.org. Um, and really, our goal is to um, build the capacity of the prevention workforce. We provide webinars and trainings. We develop resources. We can provide technical assistance. And all of this is free to you. So don't hesitate to either reach out to us or your regional PTTC um, to find out what we can do for you. So beyond the Prevention Technology Transfer Center, each region also has a Mental Health Technology Transfer Center and an Addiction Technology Transfer Center. Again, they're really about um, supporting the workforce, whether it's the treatment and recovery or the mental health workforce. 
Um, in the Southeast region, our mental health TTTC is located at Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. And our Addiction Technology Transfer Center is located at Morehouse School of Medicine's National Center for Primary Care. Um, so if, you, if you'd like information on how to contact, how to reach those two centers, um, just, just reach out to us at the PTTC and we can connect you. So, as I said in the beginning, today is part one of a three part series, and it's all about providing information to you um, on preventing excessive drinking and um, underage drinking through alcohol policies. And we've broken it out into why, why we're even doing this, what do we mean by alcohol policies, and how do you develop and promote in, um, local alcohol policies? So um, you're all here today, which is great. And many of you I see have registered for the second one, which is on October 27th. And then our final session, the registration should be available very soon if it's not already there for our December 8th wrap up session three on how. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mark Wolfson, who is the co-director of the Southeast Prevention Technology Transfer Center. He's going to set the stage and introduce our speakers. Thanks, Kristen. Can you hear me okay? Great. Well, we are we are really excited about at uh, the Southeast PTTC to host this in a highly interactive uh, webinar today on alcohol policy. Uh, so we all know, I think you have an appreciation that alcohol policy is a critical topic nationally, but we think this is especially true in those eight Southeast states that you saw on the map that Kristen showed. And I guess the most polite way to say it is that uh, there are incredible opportunities to do imp impactful work on alcohol policy, especially local alcohol policy in the Southeast United States. So you'll hear much more about that over the course of this, uh, this interactive webinar. Um, so alcohol policy, we're also excited about it because it's a, a topic that's near and dear to our hearts at the Southeast PTTC. Uh, so I at the University of California Riverside and my colleagues at Wake Forest School of Medicine have uh, done a lot of uh, our research focused on uh, the role of policy and other environmental strategies in addressing underage drinking, uh, high-risk drinking by uh, college students, and uh, most recently, alcohol outlet uh, density and uh, disparities and inequities related to uh, alcohol outlet density. Um, and the third reason we're really excited about this uh, webinar today is the partnership that it represents. So this has been in the making for a long time, but represents a partnership between our PTTC, which you've heard a lot about already from Kristen, uh, the CDC funded Center for Advancing Alcohol Science to Practice and the US Alcohol Policy Alliance. This is the uh, first time the three of us have uh, partnered and uh, we are really thrilled uh, to do so uh, for the first in this three part series. So our presenters today, uh, we're very excited about the presenters as well. Uh, first, you'll hear from Elizabeth Parsons, who's the Associate Director of the Center for Advancing Alcohol Study Science to Practice. Uh, Liz has a master's in education from the University of Bristol in the UK, and she's worked for over 20 years in the field of youth and community health. Uh, she was a leader in the public health response to Massachusetts review of alcohol laws. And I, I really like this part in her bio. She especially enjoys supporting public health professionals in their efforts to increase awareness and knowledge about impactful alcohol policies. Um, so perfect for this, um, uh, our topic today. Uh, the second person you'll hear from is a Snigda Pederetti. Uh, and Snigda is a, a pre-doctoral fellow who supports the Center for Advancing Alcohol Science to Practice, as well as uh, the American Public Health Association Alcohol Action Network. She's currently a PhD student at uh, Emory uh, Rollins School of uh, Public Health, as an MPH uh, from North Carolina as well, from UNC Chapel Hill. And uh, broadly, Sninga studies the impacts of structural determinants 
of Health on Inequities and Substance Use Related Harms. And finally, our third speaker is Michael Sparks. So uh, Michael is the president of Sparks Initiatives. He's an alcohol policy specialist, and today he's wearing his hat as co-chair for the U.S. Alcohol Policy Alliance uh, Advisory Board. Uh, so Michael has been working for many years in, with communities uh, with a particular focus on using policy to reduce alcohol-related problems. Um, over the years, he's worked with CAPCA, with Wake Forest School of Medicine, Johns Hopkins, and others on alcohol policy issues. So without further ado, uh, let me hand it over to Liz for, to hear about why alcohol policy, a community approach to reduce community harms. Liz. Thank you so much, Mark. Can everybody hear me? Yes, excellent. Well, it's a pleasure to be presenting with you all today. Thank you, Kim, Mark, and Kristen, and everyone at the Southeast PTTC for being such incredible partners in the prevention field. And welcome to all of our participants. Whether you're new to the field or you're here after a while, we are really excited that you joined us today. And I am very excited to tell you about our organization, the Center for Advancing Alcohol Science to Practice. At the center, we're building the capacity of communities to use alcohol science for healthy, safe, and equitable neighborhoods through evidence-based population level strategies. And we'll learn a little bit more about what I mean by that later. We offer community and state partners, technical assistance or TA, to move toward the policy solutions that we know can make a lasting change to reduce excessive alcohol use like the strategies that are outlined in the community guide, which I'll ask my colleague Isabel now to put the link to the community guide in the chat, please. And Isabel, you could go ahead and put our website in, alcoholsciencetopractice.org, and a contact email for us. And we can include that a little bit later on in the webinar as well. So our approach has four pillars amplifying resources and increasing capacity, delivering training and technical assistance, enhancing access to the science and the research, and supporting the translation of effective strategies to public health practice. And through this webinar series, we aim to touch upon all of these pillars. Our strategy overall is, was, is to weave together the alcohol policy field, reinforce existing connections, and integrate new ones. As part of our efforts to amplify resources and increase capacity, we have an outstanding 13 organization partnership council, some of which you most likely have heard of. It includes CADCA, the U.S. Alcohol Policy Alliance, the PTTC Network, uh, the Alcohol Action Network, National Cancer Prevention Organizations, and many more. So we will build on these partnerships and connections, showing that in this work, we will be stronger together. And another pillar I'd like to highlight for our, our center is our training and technical assistance. We help community and state partners identify gaps and strengths related to alcohol use prevention. We provide helpful resources like fact sheets and topic briefs and connect you with experts in the field who can guide you in developing and working toward a tailored policy solutions. And much of our TA is about supporting states and localities to translate effective strategies into public health practice. And as an example, our TA requests uh, to date have included a state asking for support around measuring the number of alcohol retailers in a certain area because of the community concern about alcohol-related harms that might occur in that region. We also recently connected a community coalition with the relevant alcohol science and research that they needed to raise awareness about potential harms related to certain policy, alcohol policies. So we're hopeful that in that particular instance, the coalition was able to position itself as the go-to resource in the community for information about alcohol policies that protect youth and others from alcohol harms. So you can see that our approach is to engage and connect the prevention field on several levels whether it's the local community, the researchers, statewide groups, or the national entities like the PTTC. Now I wanna turn it over to my colleague Snigda to start us off on the why, why, why alcohol policies. 
So for this poll, um, just to let people know, we're going to ask you to just put put your responses in the chat. Our poll, for some reason, just crashed because it's WebEx. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you, Liz, uh, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, as Liz mentioned, and also Mark introduced me, my name is Snigda, um, and it's just very nice to be with you all today. Um, so for the next few minutes, I'll be talking about the health and societal impacts of excessive drinking. Uh, but before we do that, we should talk about what exactly we mean by excessive drinking since the CDC um, has a standardized definition for this behavior. Um, I'll turn it over to all of you for this question, and I already see a bunch of responses um, coming in in the chat. But what is the definition of excessive drinking? Is it the same thing as binge drinking, which is defined as four or more drinks on one occasion for women and five or more drinks on one occasion for men? Is it heavy drinking defined as eight or more drinks per week for women or 15 or more drinks per week for men? Is it any alcohol used by pregnant women and anyone under the age of 21? Or is it all of the above things I just mentioned? And I see that there is not much variation in the responses that people are giving, which it's that's great. I mean, everyone got the right answer, so that's wonderful. Um, thank you, Liz. Um, it may come as a surprise to some of you, but maybe not given the responses. Um, but excessive alcohol use is broadly defined uh, by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, again, it's defined as all of the things that I mentioned before. It's it's binge drinking, it is heavy drinking, and um, it's any alcohol used by pregnant women or pregnant persons, and it's any alcohol used by those under the age of 21 years. Um, I incorporate this information just to make sure we're all working from the same definition as we move through the rest of the presentation. So, now that we've established a definition of excessive drinking, uh, let's talk about why we should work on preventing it. Next slide, please. Um, based on the most recent estimates from the CDC's alcohol related disease impact application, um, and maybe Isabel, you could put a link to the RD application in the chat. Um, but based on these most recent estimates, more than 140,000 people die from excessive drinking in the US every year. Um, and I'll note that these estimates use data from 2015 to, to 2019 and don't include the more recent increases in alcohol consumption and related harms during the COVID-19 pandemic. That's just important to keep in mind for now. And we'll touch on, on the impacts of the pandemic a little bit later on. Next slide, please. It's also important to remember that nine out of 10 people who drink excessively do not meet the diagnostic criteria of being alcohol dependent. This is often a myth um, that drives both prevention efforts and policy responses. But the reality is that there are a number of adults who are drinking too much and are not um, technically alcohol dependent, depending on the diagnostic criteria, but they do still experience or perpetuate harms related to drinking, some of which I will discuss in a few slides. According to the 2019 Youth Risk Behavior Survey data, which is publicly available, um, almost a third of high school aged youth are current drinkers. And while this figure has gone down in the last few decades from around 50% uh, or so, maybe a little bit less, uh, we have not been noticing this continued decrease in more recent years. So the prevalence of current drinking among high schoolers has stayed about the, the same in the last um, in the last three to five years. And of the different types of excessive drinking we discussed prior, binge drinking, again, uh, drinking four to five standard drinks in one occasion, is the most common form of excessive drinking and is also associated with the most harm. It's responsible for 42% of the deaths attributed to excessive drinking, 55% of years of potential life lost, and 77% of economic costs. This chart uh, shows all the deaths from excessive drinking. So zooming back out, uh, excessive drinking, um, not just the subset from binge drinking. 
And while deaths from acute causes like motor vehicle crashes or alcohol poisonings may not be surprising to all of us, uh, excessive drinking is also linked to deaths from chronic causes like cancer, heart disease, et cetera. And um, these estimates for alcohol attributable deaths uh, t for chronic conditions may even be an undercount because it's harder to identify the, the cases where excessive drinking has played a role. And in this diagram, you can see that the leading causes of death among people aged 34 or less are mostly unintentional injuries, suicide, and homicide. And uh, based on the evidence, we know that alcohol is a contributing factor to, to these leading causes. In fact, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that 47% of homicides are attributed to excessive drinking, 32% of falls, 28% of motor vehicle crashes, 24% of suicides, and 18% of firearm injuries. And um, this data is based on excessive drinking from across the country. Um, and we're not talking about any level of drinking contributing to these harms, but excessive drinking specifically based on the CDC definition. Another reason why we emphasize preventing excessive drinking is because alcohol contributes to harm to people other than the drinker. Excessive drinking is associated with physical, sexual, and psychological violence in our communities. Harms to fetuses from drinking by pregnant people, motor vehicle crashes, property crimes, financial harms, child neglect and maltreatment, social disorganization. And we also know that um, the earlier age of initiation of drinking, um, the, the higher the frequency of drinking among youth in the same household. And I wanted to take a moment here to uh, reflect on the, the magnitude of these harms to other people and how most people, including those who may be here with us uh, in this webinar today, have people close to them whose lives have been forever touched by alcohol, um, lives lost or, or lives substantially impacted, um, or lives regained through recovery. So I just wanted to take a moment and um, just just touch on people's lived experiences with alcohol related harms and remind um, ourselves that we do this work to prevent suffering and save lives. So thank you all for, for your interest in this work and for doing what you do. About a decade ago, scientists estimated that costs related to excessive drinking, specifically costs related to healthcare, motor vehicle crashes, uh, criminal legal system processes, and productivity losses, they total to approximately $250 billion in the US per year. Uh, and importantly, people other than the drinker and local and state uh, governments um, bear most of the cost of excessive drinking. Um, and when I say local and state governments, um, I'll just make it really explicit that um, that this means taxpayers by association as well, bear most of the cost of excessive drinking. And this is still the most recent national estimate available that we have now, but hopefully we'll get more updated estimates in the coming years. And recent studies have also demonstrated that COVID has exacerbated drinking and associated harms. Studies reported increases in alcohol sales, perhaps due to increasing availability through third party delivery, just as one example. Um, there's also been an increase in drinking to cope with stress and emergency departments vis visits related to alcohol. Um, and also the number of deaths involving alcohol sharply increased between 2019 and 2020. And it's important to note that many states have made or are making home delivery and to go policies permanent but compliance efforts, so efforts to check IDs and uh, comply with regulations to protect consumers, like delivering manu manufactured seals, sealed drinks, for an example, um, these efforts are not keeping pace with the rapidly increasing availability of alcohol across states. Okay, now that we've uh, discussed 
uh, why we focus on excessive drinking, I'll turn it over to our next speaker, Michael Sparks, who will guide us in thinking about um, community level risk factors associated with excessive drinking and the related harms. Uh, thanks again. That was great. That was really a, a nice overview. And we talked quite a bit in the context of uh, the slides about the individual risks of harms to others. And I appreciate that last slide where we began to transition a little bit into thinking about community level risk factors. And so part of what we'd like to do here is start with the notion of many of you, I'm sure, work in local communities. Um, you may work at the city level, neighborhood level, perhaps at the county level, and you're you're constantly looking at the way in which alcohol problems show up. But here we're interested in thinking a bit first about what are some of the risk factors as you think about these statistics, as you think about um, alcohol and its place in society that you consider uh, as contributing to the problems in communities. And so if you take a moment in the chat box, drop in some of your thoughts about why we have these rates of excessive drinking, why we have these rates of underage drinking and, and all the related harms, um, this would be a good place to start our, our pivot and our transition to thinking about community. So, moment and on the chat box. Perception of low risk, okay, part of the culture, absolutely. This will permissive parental attitudes, easy access, hyper-availability. All that density, absolutely. Stigma around therapy, self-medicating, community and social norming. And a lack of accountability. Mm -hmm. Thoughts. Home environment supports it, and around that parental that parental uh, support piece you mentioned a moment ago. Often see this in the context of parties. Yes, it's serving at home. Others advertising. Lack of support. Good. Care involvement. Drinking venues are located where you have to drive to and from them. Yes, we saw some pretty significant numbers around motor vehicle crashes during Smigda's presentation. All right, I'll keep thinking about that as we go here. Um, often, when we think about the the contributing factors, the the local the the risk factors that contribute to how you understand problems in your own community related to alcohol. We think about, and with some of these were mentioned, the sort of community norms and the way in which the community thinks about the acceptability of alcohol. We think about the uh, the place where alcohol is sold, outlet density, its proximity to other sensitive land uses. We think about how cheap is it? Uh, you know, is it is there is your community full of low cost, high content, risky alcohol products? We think about the advertising. So I mentioned that in in their in their chat. The, the, the constant bombardment of, of alcohol promotions and advertising uh, in, in all forms of, of uh, locations that sell alcohol on premise, off premise. And we think of the actual products themselves, the constant evolution of the products that are available to target specific uh, communities. These are often what we call the four Ps. And the four Ps of price, place, product, and promotion are in fact risk factors, community level risk factors, along with social norms um, and community attitudes. So let's transition to the next slide, please. Part of what we understand, and, and, and much of this research and work and this approach comes from CATCA, so you know, shout out to them for this, that risk factors themselves tend to be very general, you know, high availability of alcohol, high alcohol outlet density, and so on. We talk then in terms of actually developing interventions and strategies about what are the local conditions, the way in which those risk factors manifest in your own communities. And we talk about local conditions as needing to be specific. Um, what are they? Identifiable, you know, can you point them out to me? And actionable, 
So this is a really important concept that if we're gonna be developing policies and responses, environmental responses to this upstream public health approaches to this, we wanna make sure that we have essentially the right issue defined. So for a couple of examples, if we talk about retail availability, the availability of alcohol in retail environments, whether it's convenience stores, gas stations, liquor stores, bars, restaurants, whatever that looks like, what's being sold. Um, one of the local conditions that many of you may experience is that retailers are selling alcohol to minors without checking ID. If we'd like to go a little deeper into that, that local condition, we'd probably be asking the question, well, which retailers? All retailers, some retailers. More so perhaps in one part of the community than another part of the community. Perhaps only certain types of, of, of uh, premises sell. Maybe it's only convenience stores as opposed to um, restaurants or bars. So these local conditions allow for the careful sort of description of the way in which your alcohol related problems manifest in your community, what they look like. And so if we take another example around community norms, frequently the way we hear communities describe sort of favorable community norms, that, uh, which is a risk factor, is community celebrations involving the use of alcohol. The questions we might ask then is which celebrations? You know, are all of the celebrations that your community is involved with have underage drinking going on? Um, adult drinking, excessive drinking, and if so, what does that look like? Is it, is it primarily adults who are uh, consuming at that event, or are young people we see getting access in some form at that community event? So this drilling down into the local conditions really helps set up the intervention, what we might call environmental or policy intervention to address it. Um, another part of that community norm is enforcement's inconsistent with limiting access to minors. Uh, again, where is the enforcement need to be occurring? Is it that they're not enforcing sales to minors in off-premise establishments? Are somehow uh, um, underage drinkers getting access in bars? Or perhaps, you know, there's uh, other, other venues where um, actual alcohol is being made available, homes and so on. So thinking about local conditions allows us as a community to be very specific about the way in which a risk factor availability, promotion, product, uh, advertising, so on, shows up. And, and so that allows then the careful analysis of what's the best evidence-based intervention to address it. So now we're gonna go into a, a breakout group, um, split up into a number of breakout groups. And the, we could go to the next slide, please. We would like you in your breakout groups, which will be about 20 minutes long, to answer and talk about these three questions. In your community, what are some of the local conditions that are related to alcohol availability? What do you see happening there? How do you understand it? Um, what are the neighborhood and community impacts that you see in your work that are related to this availability? What's that look like? Do you, do you have parks, for example, in my community where I live, which happens to be a beach community, every, every Saturday morning, every Sunday morning, we have excessive numbers of beer cans, trash, debris on our beaches. And if you happen to go to those beaches between the hours of 10 a.m. and 1 a.m., you're gonna find that there's large numbers of underage, drink, of underage drinkers going on with bonfires, which are illegal. So we have different ways in which it shows up in different, in different communities. And finally, what changes in the access and availability um, uh, and their associated problems have you seen during COVID? There's been a lot of shifting in the way in which drinking is occurring, and the you know, concurrent problems that are associated with that change in drinking behavior during COVID. We're really interested in, in understanding more about what you're seeing happening. So with that, let's go into our groups. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start the groups. I think we have 10 breakout groups and there is a facilitator assigned to almost all of them, but I think one or two in the end, we don't necessarily have a facilitator. So if someone in the group wants to step up and offer to make sure that the questions are asked and I'll send them to you um, and that everyone has a chance, you know, step up, step back. And if someone wants to take notes um, or at least remember some of the real high points, that would be great. So I'm going to start the breakouts now and I believe you see how, where you can join them under participants.
Welcome back, Michael. Mostly you should be muted when you come back into the room. So you have to unmute yourself for those who are speaking. I said you beamed us back too soon. We were right in the middle of the conversation. I gave you an extra minute. Well, maybe we can continue any great points here because we are a little bit ahead of schedule team. So there's we, we've got lots of time to discuss. We were we were deep into it. It was really a very <sighs> interesting conversation. So rather than go group by group, what I think I'd like to do is just open the floor for some reflections on these questions. Excuse me. Some particularly, what are some of the local conditions you all are seeing? I was surprised by some of the things I heard in our group, but I'd be interested. Um, who would like to share around what what your group talked about? Your own experience with that. I have placed the questions in the chat, and if anyone, um, if a group wants to go, if you want to raise your hand like that, select a little raise hand, then we, um, then we can call on you. Or since no one is stepping up, whoever the first person to unmute can go for it. Well, we if they don't, well, oh, if they. It. Well, if they do not tell you, Ms. Morgan will, and we see Colton on the line that Xavier will run his mouth. Hello, everyone. We had a great team meeting. Morgan done a fantastic job leading us off, and we we'll continue it all through our meeting. But uh, I am muted to share some things that I shared with the team when it comes to the questions. What are the local contributing factors um, that we are seeing in our county when it comes to alcohol availability? We are seeing uh, what we call uh, mom and pop hole in the walls. Uh, I stay in a very rural community, our county, where there's about 25,800 citizens and we're very rural. So we're dealing with alcohol sales in old cafes uh, where they are way outside of the county and uh, they can get accessibility to alcohol real easy. Also, I shared with them the uh, another thing we're dealing with is we'll uh, dealing with moonshine starting to come back up. Um, moonshine is starting to come back up way out in rural areas and try to combat that. But the biggest thing is, I was sharing with them is, we are dealing with retail stores being put in distressed communities. And distressed communities in my county most consist of African Americans and Latinos. And what they do is they put these retail stores in communities where uh, it's made accessible, it's made easy to get, and then it's made easy to distribute in the community. Uh, you can tell when alcohol is being sold in my county uh, in, in retail stores because you get it in a black uh, plastic bag. And most of the time you see someone carrying a black paper bag, they do not have a Coke or Pepsi or Sunkiss or Mountain Dew, they have alcohol. And uh, they are close to what I call projects in our communities. Uh, so how do we combat that? We combat that by uh, working with law enforcement and doing retail compliance checks and going in the school system and talking to our youth about the importance of staying alcohol free. And like I told them earlier, and I ended with this, um, COVID has played a big role because on Sundays when it comes to alcohol sale, you can buy it at a certain time, you see more people at the uh, alcohol store. Uh, we have a place here called Wine and Spirits. Wow, what a name. You get some wine and they give you some spirits. Um, ain't nothing like the Holy Ghost, though, but, you know, they rather have the wine and the spirits. So we see more of them uh, at the store than we do at church. Ain't that something? <laughs> right. I'm done. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank yeah, you Xavier? for starting that off. That was awesome. Yeah. That, was such a, that was such a great introduction to this topic. I loved it. Yeah. Can I just mention I was in the group with Xavier and Xavier, I just wanted to ask one question. Is that a dry county or not? Uh, no, ma'am, it's not. No, ma'am. Okay. Okay. No, ma just curious. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. You're welcome. I, I enjoyed our time. <laughs> so you covered a lot of bases. I'm really interested in hearing from some of the other groups about particularly their retail environment, because there's a lot of talk in our group about the retail environment and IDs and things along those lines. So what about what did others what did others see happening in their communities? I'll jump in. Hi, everybody. My name is Astrid. Great to be here. Uh, along with many other states, we had much more permissible uh, during the, the COVID pandemic, much more permissible ordinances passed, 
where people can take alcohol to go, get it delivered. And one of our members uh, spoke about that within her community. And so it made, it, you know, it kind of prompted us to think about, well, how active are the alcohol industry or the convenient or, you know, I'm not sure. And because we know there's big tobacco, there's big alcohol, how actively involved were they in pushing forward these ordinances, these new policies, allowing for more permission to bring alcohol outside, to serve it outside, to deliver it, to drive away with it, to take it to go. So we're talking about, you know, the, the, the friendship between decision makers and the alcohol industry, which would benefit from more permission. Um, what we see uh, in in our community, I, I work in a in a small suburban and urban community in Rhode Island, and what we find is that level of alcohol use is high, especially during our, especially in the community of our unhoused friends, um, and uh, so that creates an environment, of course, where they're less likely to wish to go, maybe to do anything to move them out of that situation because they are, uh, as one of the gentlemen that I was speaking with last week, um, he just said, look, we're, we're drunks and we don't have any, you know, we need help, we need help. And alcohol is very accessible more so than other things for them. And at least the folks that he was referring to, I'm not generalizing, I'm, I'm only sharing the story here. So for us, it was more about the permission that came with COVID uh, because we wanted to support small businesses. That's always this balance, right, between health and safety, community health, and we want to support small businesses. And I think that if I were a decision maker, that's a real tough place to be in because you never want to appear that you're anti-small business. So this is our uh, dilemma. And you covered some really important points related to some of the regulatory rollbacks that happen in most states. And the consequences of that in terms of the policies that were adopted initially, they were adopted as temporary and then they, many of them became permanent and some of the consequences of that. So that was that was very helpful. Thank you. Other other thoughts. We're really covering a lot of terrain. They're very helpful. We have Morgan. She raised her hand. Hi there. Can everyone hear me? Awesome. So my name is Morgan and I am from Issaquah, Washington. It is about 30 minutes from Seattle. I work with Influence the Choice, um, which is a grassroots nonprofit in the Issaquah area serving East King County. Um, one of the things that we've noticed a lot of is parents buying alcohol for youth or older siblings. So trying to figure out how we can intercept that um, in grocery stores, that's a bit difficult sometimes, you know, um, all that the clerks can really do or managers is like ask, hey, is this for you or for your child? And it's really difficult to deal with that. So we work a lot from the educational perspective of teaching parents why they should set clear boundaries and use a lot of evidence based. Um, sorry, I'm losing my words a little bit um, evidence based strategies. And then I think for us, one of the major things that I've noticed personally is since 2011, there was a law that shifted where grocery stores and other like retailers like Target can sell alcohol and hard liquor. And that's really changed a lot of accessibility and parents and youth. So we'll have children sometimes like go into the stores and grab bottles for their parents because they can walk right in and touch it and be like, oh, mom, you forgot this. And I've seen that happen before. So that's a really interesting point, I think, is just the accessibility, the amount that our youth are being exposed to this and being able to walk in instead of having to go into a liquor store. Um, our group has also talked about what Xavier talked about, as well as um, over in Boston, there's a app that was made by college students um, where they could have alcohol delivered and it was being delivered to minors and there was enough money backing it that it became a functional app, which is another fascinating thing I found. And then over in a smaller town, probably a little bit out of Phoenix, there are shopping malls that are allowing drinking as well now. And if you can shop and drink mixed with the gun culture over in Arizona, it can create a really dangerous situation and um, the person who is sharing this, I'm sorry, I don't remember names at the moment, 
but they were saying that about every weekend there's a party on the weekend with youth and there's shootings because of people being able to open carry. Yeah, that was me, Mar Marianne from Phoenix. Yeah, it's it's uh, between uh, the drinking and guns. Uh, it's really a harsh environment. And there doesn't seem to be much desire to change it. Because of Brianna, uh, you say the shootings that, are happening in home environments. Pardon? Where are the shootings generally happening? They so often happen at family gatherings. People are drinking at college gatherings. People are drinking neighborhood gatherings. People are drinking and they have guns. So when people have a little argument or whatever, you know what, what happens at that point. And that and that's pretty typical here. Uh, and unfortunately, our legislature uh, uh, is is of the bent that doesn't seem to find that they want to control either the drinking or the or the guns. So here in Arizona, that's about it, and then I guess. I was just going to add at the end that in our Issaquah community, uh, we use a healthy use survey to measure data of student usage. And since the pandemic, we've actually seen a decrease in consumption of all substances and alcohol use. Um, because a lot of parents had the privilege in this area of working virtually, that created a lot more connection and communication between guardian and student. So that's been beneficial for us in that sense. However, there have been mental health issues that have been rising. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Marianne. Great summaries. Other other comments. Michael, I thought I saw Lauren's hand up just a little bit earlier. Um, I'm not seeing her now. Yeah, there she is. You did. Um, and I have to say, like Sorry. Morgan kind of took the words right out of my mouth. I'm composing a kudos email to her right now because she um said uh, everything that I was going to say. Um so thank you, Morgan. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> Hey, Michael. I could quickly add that um, I'm just just hearing recently from the teenagers in our community that they're they're where social access used to be the number one way kids got access to alcohol in our community. Now it seems to be online. And I was so stunned by that. I didn't even ask was this like home delivery or was this just like um, black market, you know, kids on Instagram and Snapchat selling to each other. So I'm we're we got our hands tied. We haven't done anything about it yet. And I just wanted to put it out there and see if, if we hear any feedback. Um, would someone in our group want to talk a little bit about the the rise in the use of fake IDs in the last couple of years? We had a really interesting discussion. It kind of surprised me. Want to say a little bit about Travals? Or yeah, go ahead, Taylor, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Taylor Moore, uh, and I was just uh, saying uh, in our group at least that that um, especially like for college students going to you know going to various parties, or if not, uh, or or trying to uh, get drinks before going to parties, um, they can possibly get the drinks from their friends, or if not, you know, with the fake IDs, uh, there may not be a lot of monitoring to make sure. That it's a legit ID or not, and then once they're able to go to these certain fraternity parties or just parties in general, as long as they just look at your ID and just glance at it from that initial. Once you get into the party, then there's no monitoring to to see how many drinks that you are in taking throughout the entirety of the party. So they can definitely cause more problems too in the long run. And then also with certain stores, uh, they may just glance at the ID and they're not really checking to make sure that it's a legit real ID. And then also there are just some owners uh, who could care less if you had an ID and they may just need money for their business. So they'll just take whatever they can get and keep going and just try to make sure that, hey, if you don't say anything, I won't say anything and just go on about your day. So there are you know, various issues there. Thank you, Taylor. Comments from the groups. We've touched to some extent on all three of the questions. Um, what the local conditions look like, what are some of the pandemic related issues and some of the consequences? What else are you what else did you cover? Talk about. 
Michael, if I could just share one 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 thought that occurred to me, we had a great conversation in, on our group, and I really would love for for some of the other members of the group to kind of share some of their 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 thinking. But what struck me, we had this wonderful representation that really went from from one corner of the country all the way up to the other end of the country, right? From Florida, um, from South Florida, all the way up through um, um, Washington State uh, and and in between. Um, and just how important the concept of the local condition um, really mattered uh, in terms of crystallizing or concretizing how um, accessibility kind of shows up, um, kind of uh, what all uh, kind of really matters if we're going to actually um, address the issue uh, and um, uh, the notion that that's not an idea that needs to be kind of skimmed over, but is really crucial uh, towards us being able to um, um, really apply some real thinking about what is it that we might be able to do about the situation. It that's struck me in, in, in all of those areas. Other other comments before we move towards wrapping up. Um, I'll go ahead and jump in. Hi, I'm Sherelle from Lawton, Oklahoma. And some of the things we've been seeing, so our county has a lot of smaller rural towns um, that are very close and tight knit. And I would say if COVID impacted anything, I think it exhausted everyone. Um, they're just exhausted and trying to do what they can to refuel themselves. And so it can be hard to convince the communities that focusing on substance misuse and underage drinking deserves their intention, their attention and their resources. Um, so that's something that's been a little bit of a challenge for us. And particularly where like policy work um, can be seen, you know, we've had some people are like straight up rude to some of our coworkers just for like calling and asking policy work questions, that type of thing. Um, and it also created a difficulty with perception. So Malawin is a military town anyway. So you have a lot of like younger soldiers coming from different places. So that kind of erodes that line of underage drinking right there for us sometimes. Um, and some of these smaller communities can consider under drinking like a rite of passage. Um, and so just really kind of getting back to a place where we're finding partners who are willing to help us do the work and who want to get involved in this area. Um, that has been difficult. So we've been doing a lot of more um, reaching out to communities and looking at how to reach our um, indirect population. How can we serve parents? How can we serve guardians in a way that will bolster health, that will lead to some of these results and build trust so that when we start coming back around with these policy work, they will remember our faces and our names and be excited to get involved with us again. Uh, thank you. That was very helpful. Uplifting. Other comments? Michael, I had my hand raised. I wanted to invite somebody from our group, my group, to. Uh, we talked about a lot of interesting things, but one of the things we talked about was differences across neighborhoods. And I know that some we're going to talk in the in the presentation about the issue of disparities, but we heard some really interesting uh, observations about uh, marketing and uh, sort of saturation and heavier exposure to marketing in. Uh, African American communities in, uh, I believe it was uh, uh, some in uh, uh, Jackson, Mississippi, if I have my facts right. So I wonder if either um, Stephanie, our reporter, or I believe it might have been Pamela uh, who uh, made that observation, if you'd like to say anything about it. Excuse me. Yes, this is Pamela. And one thing I I meant to say, and I I forgot, is that I think some of it also has to do with the economy. So if you're able to sell alcohol in places that normally you would not be able to, and if people are able to access it, take it out of the bars into the streets for festivals and for those neighborhoods who have um, become sort of resort status areas. And so that increases the availability, not only for adults, but also for 
our young people who are being underage drinkers. Anyone else? Any final comments? Reflections on your group discussion? Hi, hey everyone. This has been a really great meeting. Um, my name is Barrett Montgomery. I'm a um, drug use epidemiologist. I work with RTI International, and I am uh, serving in, in a research capacity, kind of helping out build out alcohol epidemiology capacity for the state of Texas. Um, I'm curious. I've I've heard this anecdotally as something that's been happening more during the pandemic, given the increase in alcohol sales and alcohol drink or you know just drinking at home, um, but also the rise in the mental health issues and uh, prescriptions of anxiolytics like um, you know benzodiazepines and I'm I'm very concerned that that's a I mean that is a very deadly combination and it can it's a definitely a combination that could also lead to longer term consequences like dependence um, so I was just curious if anybody has seen any data on that because I really have not yet I've only heard about this sort of anecdotally and thought about it theoretically Marissa, have you seen anything um, at your end? Anything come across your desk? Hi, I'm sorry. I'm having some problems with this WebEx platform. Could you repeat that? It was cutting out. Uh, you have you would. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Just uh, phrase your question again, if you would. That'd be great. Sure. Uh, I've been looking for any possible data sources on uh, rising sort of co-occurrence, or I guess you would call it polysubstance use, with between alcohol and benzodiazepines, given the rise of um, anxiety and mental health issues during the pandemic, but also increases in prevalence of drinking. Yeah, we have um, we have seen associations between excessive drinking and the use of benzodiazepines. And there's a study from a few years ago that looked at trends in mortality related to the co-use of both of those. And the first author was uh, Marco Tori. It was a JAMA study. And um, they also looked at, I think Stingda just put it in the chat, and um, they also looked at alcohol and opioids, I believe. And then the National Survey on Drug Use and Health is also a good source of information on use of various substances. And um, and I'll, the, the issue is that when you start looking at the state data specifically, you're going to get into pretty small sample sizes with the co-use of, of multiple drugs. But um, our, we have a study from a just a few years back on using National Survey on Drug Use and Health with the uh, on the use of alcohol and various other substances that might be a helpful reference as a starting point. And I'm not sure if you know which study I'm referring to. I was the lead author on that. Otherwise, I can put it in the chat in a minute as well. Um, so uh, those would be in, uh, starting data sources as a suggestion. And then one other data source would be emergency department uh, surveillance. Um, syndromic surveillance, for example, sometimes has some useful information. Thank you, Marissa. Um, Kristen, how are we doing? We got another minute or so? Where are we? We're fine. We, we can take um, another minute or two, absolutely. Great. Last comments. Just begin to wrap this up in terms of, uh, let me just frame one observation that I've been hearing both on the comments in my group is the the extent to which retail of access and availability and the consequences of promotion some of these issues that we talked about are seem to have grown in sort of the experience of you all as opposed to what I think historically has been more and more social access particularly for young people we had a long conversation about the rise of fake IDs in different in our group and the extent to which they're being used now and the lack of compliance checks, perhaps because they weren't doing compliance checks during COVID, but just the ease in which now young people um, are able to get access at retail settings, which I think previous to certainly the last few years before this, I was hearing that the primary source of, of access was around home parties. 
they were getting through social sources. It was an interesting observation I heard in my group. I don't know if it's true for others, but that was one of the things we talked about. Other concluding observations or ahas you might have had in the context of your discussion in your groups. Well, Michael, we heard the opposite in our group uh, from uh, one individual who, I mean, or actually talked about equivalent uh, increases in both. And so this person did talk about increased uh, commercial availability, but also talked about in the home environment, the, the parents are drinking more. You know, we've seen this overall rise in consumption and have adopted a more permissive uh, attitude uh, towards um, underage drinking uh, by their by their children. Um, so it was an interesting counterpoint we heard. Thanks, Mark. Uh, can I just mention something? Um, what was interesting is that for many years, supposedly advertising hard liquor on TV was um, was outlawed or or there were laws against it. And now it's come back. So the laws must have gone away. Or maybe it's just in, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know, it might depend on the particular state, but I know here in Arizona, uh, there were no hard liquor uh, advertisements until the last couple of years. And that, that had, did people see that or was that something, am I, am I imagining that, that they were outlawed? Uh, all those, yes, those have all been sunsetted. You are now able to advertise. Um, uh, there were there were sanctions against there were there were voluntary agreements amongst the distillers not to advertise on, okay. on TV and then when streaming picked up all that changed and when the cable stations picked up that changed and now it it, it has as you said Marianne really permeated and and it increased the amount of product placement in 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 TV shows and movies all of that has changed the amount of promotion that goes on inside of retail establishments is through the roof now. Uh, it's it's astounding. And then, of course, the whole uh, rise of social media and the way in which the industry targets individuals through social media, both of age and underage. So you've okay. picked up, I think, on a really important trend that's occurring nationally. Yeah, that uh, seemed very new to me the last couple of years. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. If, if I could just chime in with one more, one, one more observation. Uh, I, I love everything that's being said, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm the first uh, minority to serve as the uh, beer board commissioner uh, here in my county, first minority, and I'm excited about it. I've served as vice chair uh, for the past three terms as county commissioner, but now I've, I'm having the opportunity to step up in the role of uh, chair. And I'm excited about it, you know, not only from a historical perspective, but from a community engagement perspective. And um, I, I think we're dealing with content and we are dealing with uh, location and we're dealing with information because now our youth are finding innovative ways to bring it in the school system. Uh, we just had three young ladies in the school system who had alcohol uh, in a tampon and they bought it in the school and they got away with it. But the content of it was different. Y'all know what they had in there? They had Dr. Tishner. And I tell people all the time, I told my brothers and sisters, that's when I was coming up, my first taste of alcohol was from my grandmama's house because Dr. Titian is 70% alcohol. So you giving 70% alcohol to a eight year old and saying it's mouthwash, you can imagine what it's doing to him. So our youth are going to have to understand the importance of staying alcohol free. But when it's a distressed area, like I stated, and then you have the window lady who's selling alcohol illegally, and then it's a gang, gang members down the street that are receiving revenue from it and getting it to her, we have a problem. How do we combat that? Through policy, what we are learning today. But then that's going to have to be implemented by leaders, those who are in position to affect change, uh, being obligated, being responsible, and being visible. And then it'll change. Well, I'm really glad you're the new chair. That's all I could say. You you're the commissioner we all need. The next brief interactive piece. And some of this we just sort of touched upon alcohol and inequities. Um, and in a moment, you'll have a chance to share how you see inequities appear in your communities uh, as it relates to alcohol harms. Um, but like every aspect of our systems and communities, inequities are also present when it comes to alcohol harms. So here are a few examples um, of what we mean. The alcohol harm paradox. 
where those of lower socioeconomic status experience more related harms, despite those of higher socioeconomic status drinking more on average. In many areas, there is a larger concentration of alcohol outlets uh, in Black and Latinx communities. And we see targeted advertising to BIPOC people, um, sorry, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and LGBTQ plus communities. And we know that women experience more severe alcohol-related harms despite drinking less than men on average, which has to do with the physiological differences in the metabolism of alcohol. So now we'd like to hear from you. Uh, in a moment, Kristen's gonna bring up a whiteboard. I'll stop sharing. Um, and the question we wanna ask is what inequities around alcohol harms do you see in your community? Who suffers from harms the most? So in order to annotate, everyone has the ability to annotate now. Um, it's over on the left of the screen. You can select the text box and you can type in an answer here. I'll give everybody a minute to think about this. If you have any questions about the technical aspect of this, please ask. Kristen will help. If you have any questions about what we're looking for, thinking about um, inequities around alcohol harms that you see in your communities, um, could be related to, to regulations. It could be related to the access and availability that we were talking about. Here's a powerful one, the children of alcoholic guardians or parents, and then we've got youth. Hmm. Yeah, and if you can't put it, if you if you can't figure out the annotation or it's not working for you, then you can put something in the chat. In fact, Xavier just wrote, it's easy for youth to get. Programs like Paint and Sip, sponsored by Community Education, Susan says. A lot of comments about youth. Neela says, causes a lot of vehicle accidents for minors. Derek says, local governments that look good on paper with ordinances, but lack accountability efforts or enforcement. And my dog really likes that response, Derek. Yeah, we were able to fill this whiteboard. It's great. So I, you know, I know I put a couple up there and some that I definitely resonate. Um, uh, in some of the communities where I've worked, certainly with these inequities. Um, and I think, it, especially as more recent data become available about what this looks like, the center will be, um, you know, we'll hope to serve as a resource to look a little bit more closely about these alcohol harms uh, and inequities. And I'm going to go back. Sharing, is that OK, Kristen? Got it. 
Okay. So now we're going to move into another why. Why take a population level approach to address uh, these uh, alcohol harms that we've talked about and the ways in which they affect um, people and um, different people in different ways? So the question is, why take a population level approach to reduce underage drinking and excessive drinking by adults? And the answer is that it's the most impactful because they are approaches that affect the whole population. You heard me reference them at the start of the webinar, evidence-based population level strategies or EBPLs for short. Uh, and we're gonna go into more detail about what those are in the next session in October, but we wanna talk about them more broadly here and how they work to protect kids and communities from alcohol harm. So we talked a lot about local conditions in the environment. The environment affects underage drinking and excessive drinking by adults. So working to change the environment and conditions in the community can impact adult excessive drinking and can directly and indirectly impact underage drinking. Many of you may be familiar with this pyramid. It shows what changes can be made to have the greatest impact on health at that population level. So the, the second to bottom segment that's sort of shaded in, I wanna highlight, this is where those evidence-based population level strategies sit. Uh, the, you know, for example, these examples here, removing dangerous products, increasing alcohol excise taxes, reducing alcohol outlets, restrict and reduce alcohol marketing, social host ordinances. Those um, are going to affect a large uh, population. And this is where these EBPLs are, where you'll find them. The largest impact means that we reduce injuries and diminish negative health outcomes and save lives. And this requires a lot. I know one of the participants referenced it's, it's a lot of work to do um, these population level out, um, strategies. Um, so it requires here, as you see on the side, it says requires most political will, a lot of effort, a lot of time potentially, but has the largest impact. These are the um, so, sorry, one example of this that we like to share is the, the seatbelt laws. A seatbelt law can apply to a whole population in a state, uh, and the use of seatbelt laws dramatically reduces the risk of death or serious injury. So thousands of lives are saved due to those laws. The same can be true for evidence-based population level strategies related to alcohol. So what does the evidence base tell us? So it's very, uh, you know, it tells us that, that policies that reduce the availability and the affordability of alcohol are associated with a reduction in overall and, and excessive drinking, a reduction in motor vehicle crashes, violence, sexually transmitted infections, and chronic disease incidents. So at our next webinar in the series, The What of Alcohol Policy, we'll be talking more about which policy specifically reduces harms. But overall, it's important to remember that policies that reduce availability and affordability of alcohol are associated with decreased harms. And before we go into the q and I just wanted to share some resources. We heard from Marissa Esser uh, today from the CDC. For those of you who don't know, Marissa is the director of the alcohol program at the CDC. Uh, and these are a couple of the websites. They're great resources. They have uh, fact sheets and online tools. I encourage you to check those out. And we also have a great partner in the American Public Health Association. Um, they came up with a policy statement in 2019 about um, a population level response to reduce alcohol related harms. Uh, and APHA's ATOD section, we mentioned the Alcohol Action Network convenes, um, is convened, um, and it's a great place to connect with other practitioners like those in the room uh, and those who've been working toward alcohol policy change for a while or some who are very new to it. Um, it's a great network to learn more about what other communities are doing to reduce alcohol harms. And SNIGDA is actually uh, 
uh, a great contact for that. Um, and you can reach her at leadership at apha-atod.org. Snake, if you want to put that in the chat for anyone. In addition to our center, the CDC funds 12 state alcohol epidemiologists. These states include California, Oregon, Idaho, Rhode Island, New Mexico, Colorado, Minnesota, Texas, New York, Alaska, North Carolina, and Maryland. And if your state was mentioned, we're very happy to connect you with your state epidemiologist if you haven't met them yet. Um, or your state may already have an epidemiologist working on alcohol. And we'd also you know, be happy to, if you want to reach out, um, we'd be happy to connect you with them um, if they exist. Uh, and just a, a note about um, the alcohol policy conference happening next week for those of you who may be attending the U.S. Alcohol Policy Alliance's AP19 conference, um, the Center for Advancing Alcohol Science to Practice is having a welcome reception on Wednesday evening after the last session around 6.15. You're more than welcome to join us. We'd love to meet you. And you can meet some of our experts uh, in the field who would could potentially provide TA to you and your community. And we'll also be hosting an interactive workshop in that conference about uh, how to frame data into effective messages that reach your audience. And Michael, I wondered if you might want to unmute and share a little bit about the conference offer offerings um, from the U.S. Alliance. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is number 19 in the Alcohol Policy Conference series. It started many years ago. This year we'll be focusing, we always have a really fascinating mix of researchers and practitioners, folks who are doing the research, some of which has been talked about here today, others who are working in communities and that intersection between folks who are researching and, and those who are doing the work on the ground it creates a really vibrant dialogue about how to move forward with your work. We have sessions that run all the way from research findings down to how do you do policy in your community. There's lots of good evening um, opportunities. For example, the, the meeting that um, Liz just mentioned, there's also a meeting um, on, on Thursday evening about how to start a state level alcohol policy alliance. So lots of exciting things going on at the conference. It begins on a Wednesday afternoon and, and ends on a Friday afternoon. Hope to see some of you there. Thanks, Liz. Thank you, Michael. So one more item before we move on to the Q&A um, is now that we have, we know evidence-based population level strategies work and are most effective, we'd like to gather some information where we'd like you to gather some more information for the next session. So between now and the October session, we ask you to find out what alcohol policies exist in your community. So you can pick a municipality or locality and look at the alcohol laws. What local alcohol policies exist? Maybe find out uh, where can alcohol be available? Is there a limit on the number of alcohol outlets your community can have? Those are just a couple of examples. Uh, and I wondered if anybody wants to put or unmute or put in the chat uh, where to sort of provide some guidance about where people may find those policies if they're to look for them. Any ideas? Well, I'd say uh, definitely you could look online. Um, maybe call your local city clerk, just to say the municipal code. Ask decision makers, certainly, your local liquor authorities. <laughs> Kristen says clerks know everything. <laughs> Great. Local police, city attorney, thank you for those ideas. If you're not sure, feel free to um, contact the, the, the webinar organizers and we can uh, help you connect with where to find that information. We can certainly talk about it at the next webinar. So with that, I wanna thank you so much for sharing your Wednesday morning slash afternoon, wherever you are, uh, and turn it over to Mark to lead us in any Q&A. Yeah, well, thank you. What a, uh, let's, let's do an early round of, uh, of uh, virtual applause and thumbs up uh, for our uh, wonderful speakers, uh, Liz, Snigda, and Michael. Uh, you know, this was just so, so uh, powerful both in terms of content, but also in terms of format. And 
the way that you uh, allowed opportunities uh, for engagement. And the engagement, I think, of participants was fantastic. So thanks to, to everybody, all the participants. Uh, so, and I think everybody, everybody is now so excited. I know I am about the what uh, on October 27th and the how on December 8th. So be sure to mark that in your Outlook calendar, your uh, monthly cal calendar hanging over your, uh, hanging in your kitchen, whatever uh, format you use. So yeah, let's open it up for questions. And um, I I'll start with a, um, a question just to kind of uh, prime the pump a little bit. Um, so I wanted to ask um, Liz a question and uh, everybody can, uh, can uh, contribute as well if they like. But um, so I, I completely agree that the populational level approach is the most impactful. And that's one reason we should be doing more in the field of alcohol policy. But I would also argue, and this is a little maybe less based on the data, but I think there is some data across multiple fields of public health, uh, obesity, tobacco, uh, traffic safety, as well as alcohol, that uh, population level approaches are also our best bet for uh, not exacerbating and maybe even reducing disparities. Because educational approaches typically don't reach everybody, whereas at least some policy approaches can reach everybody and in fact, some can especially affect lower income communities, for example. So I just wanted to see what you thought about that, that not only should we be working on alcohol policy as a environmental, um, as, envir as a population level strategy because of its overall impactfulness, but also because of its capacity to re reduce disparities and inequities. Yeah, and you uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think the value of the population level strategies is um, that is designed to impact everyone. And <clears throat> hopefully, you know, we, you would see uh, those outcomes um, also change for those who suffer the most harms because of the population level strategies. Um, I would also like to bring in my colleagues um, to weigh in on if they have any uh, thoughts or potentially any research around this question. I know it's a passion of, of many on the call, so I don't wanna be the sole responder. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, yes, it is extremely important to leverage population level approaches to promote health equity. Um, especially when you use community engaged strategies to identify policy levers that are that are really important for a specific community. And I would encourage you all, if you're in like the health equity space at all, to really think about what you mean by community when you're working with a specific one and um, establish rapport, build important relationships with them and engage them in um, every step of the way from identifying important alcohol policy levers to implementing them and then to evaluating them. But it is, it is extremely important to um, address population level um, strategies if, you, if that is your focus, which it should be for all of us uh, to promote health equity in alcohol related outcomes. So um, that's a passion of mine personally is, is just thinking about the many community engaged strategies we could use, we could incorporate along in that in that like circular policy cycle that that some of you may be familiar with. So if you have any questions about that, then feel free to reach out to me. Great. Thank you, Snicker. Well, actually, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Kristen, who I think has been monitoring the chat and can um, and curating questions. I'm having a little bit of a hard time seeing the questions at the moment. So Kristen, I wonder if you can uh, if you can uh, field some of the uh, questions to our uh, speakers. 
you know, I I haven't seen any. I've seen the I've seen a few. Snigda responded to a few of them already, um, and I haven't really seen any questions. So I would encourage you if if you have a question or if you asked a question in the chat and I'm not seeing it, go ahead and unmute. This is your opportunity right now. Yeah. I've got a Can question. I, oh, oh, sorry. I'll, I'll... go Ask ahead. <laughs> I'll oh, wait. I thought someone else was chiming in, so I didn't want to interrupt. Astrid, I think you can go first and then. Uh... Okay. So Megan in our small group talked about um, the, the fact that in her town, which is dry, that in the neighboring towns, which are not dry towns, that they have started to have designated drinking areas, kind of like smoking shacks of yore or still currently. But they're designated areas where people are allowed to drink openly, you know, in town on the sidewalk, essentially. And going back to what I had mentioned earlier, which is um, the piece where the alcohol industry is involved in creating the very ordinances that allow more permission. That when I brought that up to Megan, she said, oh, they were very involved in determining further permissions. So my question is, how can we, what can we do to remove those alcohol industry folks from being able to have that much in, impact on our public health? How do we get them out of decision-making tables? Michael, I'd recommend, if you don't mind addressing that, perhaps on behalf of the Alliance. Thanks. That's a great question. I heard you, I heard you mention it earlier. So I, so I could see that this was something that you were interested in. You know, we have, we have alcohol represent. This is all driven by green money and, you know, the, whether the policy makes is at the state level, whether their contributions occurring at the local level or just relationships happening in that regard. We can't, we can't get them out. We have to out muscle them. And, and so what this really boils down to as a core principle for our field is that our work at the local level has to be about building power, resident power to push back against the corporate influences that are taking place. And it really requires a shift in our thinking about how we do our work from just relying on sector-based representation in our coalition to building a base of power of residents who are not constricted or restricted from saying what they wanna be able to say and pushing back. We have power if we influence those who make decisions and we can influence those by making decisions by turning out lots of people. That's my short answer. And we're gonna talk more about this in in uh, webinar number three, but I really appreciate the fact you brought it up because it's central, not just in alcohol, it's central across all of our fields around tobacco, cannabis, um, opioids, big pharma, big tobacco, we see this big food, big soft drinks, it's all there. Yeah, so yeah. thank you for raising that. And, you know, I second that uh, the liquor industry and these other industries, gun industry, et cetera, they are ultra, ultra powerful because they give tons of tons of money to the people who run for offices. And, and so that has to be dealt with. Um, and they're allowed to do that. They don't even have to. And now a lot of states don't require them to even um, say how much money they've given to candidates. So that's something to think about. Thank you for that question and those comments uh, from the uh, U.S. Alcohol Policy Alliance. Uh, and I do want to point out that that QR code in the upper right, because we've been getting some questions, is the link to the evaluation. So please, as we're talking, if you could uh, take a uh, uh, put your phone up to it and um, and go ahead and complete the uh, evaluation and provide the feedback that we need. Um, any are there other questions? Um, Oh, this is kind of cool to see everybody put their phone up. That was a nice piece of uh, audience participation. Uh, other questions, please just uh, unmute and speak. Um, yes, Morgan, uh, unless someone else uh, had their hand up who I haven't seen, uh, Morgan, you're up. Awesome, so this question isn't directly related to policy, but um, as everyone here seems to be professionals in the field with different experience, I was wondering if I could get some input. So our organization has been trying to make an effort to reach out to communities that we previously haven't connected with as much, such as like the Latino community. So with that said, um, 
we are providing different resources and um, in different languages as well as trying to kind of reach out. But it's really hard to have people like, you know, meet us at the middle. So how would you say is, or what would you say is the best use of our time and resources as far as connecting with communities that we haven't connected with before? I think probably any of us, any of the presenters could address that. I can, I'm happy to go first. Um, and Snigda actually sort of mentioned this, right? Um, when she was talking about addressing inequities. Uh, you know, I would say there's different levels of coalitions or community, uh, community coalitions or organizations trying to, um, you know, do the work that you mentioned. And uh, I think um, the, the communities that I've seen do this work most effectively is when they are sharing their power with the um, intended uh, community that they want, you know, that, that who will be served by the work. So if you're, if you, you mentioned Latinx community as an example, uh, so really thinking about as a coalition, as an organization, um, what power are you sharing that you have with the Latinx community? Um, is, is there anybody with lived experience um, in that community on your board, on your coalition, on your staff uh, to um, really begin that process of uh, the, the community and the residents participating and actively um, building their power to address those issues. Because um, if you don't do that, and if you don't have that lived expertise uh, of, of the communities who will be served by the work, then you run the danger of, of really missing the mark. Um, so having them, you know, uh, engaged and, and uh, sort of sharing your own power, whatever that might mean, um, in terms of resources or attention and time or um, that uh, I think that is one place to start. I know of one uh, municipality who hired community liaisons. So they had a, a very diverse community. And so they hired seven community liaisons with, with lived experience from um, different um, uh, different, um, I think they were all cultural and linguistic um, sectors and uh, paid them, put them on payroll and built up their um, skills and, um, you know, really leveraged their passion for serving those communities to help develop their, their prevention plan. Ms. Lee, if I could just add to what you said, I think that was a very valuable point that you said. So I applaud you for that because that is so true. Uh, I just believe that the community is stronger than the retail store that it's in uh, because the community is the one that's generating the money and the flow uh, through that retail store. So the community is much stronger than the retail store and the location. Uh, but at the same time, too, I think that uh, we have to implement some strategies when it comes to even the clerks that they hire. So we are trying to implement responsible various training uh, to the retail stores to get their uh, clerks trained on looking at ID and trained on looking at uh, people coming in the store with fake ID. So what you said is very valuable because when it comes to community engagement, it is important that the community understand liquor ordinance. Uh, understanding liquor sales, even understanding what kind of alcohol they have in the store. Uh, so you do that by bringing in presenters, as you said, liaisons in the community and from a community level who are in positions that can affect change or even distribute the, 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 uh, the licenses, uh, getting to understand how they go about getting the license, the prices, the fines, the policy is very important. And I think when you do that with engagement as far as the community with the location of the retail store, they are more unlikely to try to do something that's out of their character. So uh, that is so true what you said. And I'm just, I'm, I'm just taking on what you just said and just adding to a very valuable point. Thanks, Liz. I wanted to thank both you and uh, 
and uh, Xavier for uh, a terrific, uh, you know, uh, closing uh, uh, discussion. I can't think of a better way to uh, wrap up the uh, the Q and A. Uh, so thank you. Let me turn it over to Kristen Kidd, who will now take us home. Okay, we just have a, a few slides just to give you some information on some resources that are available. Do remember it's a three part series and you still have the what and the how. So make sure you go to the pttcnetwork.org slash southeast to register. And I did put the link to the second one in in the chat. And the P Southeast PTTC has developed some resources. We have a, a, a guidebook that um, can guide a community on how to do a local policy and their activities back in the appendices for all of the 10 steps. And you'll hear a lot more about this on session three. But if you're interested in um, being notified when the, the guidebook is being updated, we're giving it a fresh look. Um, if you want to uh, know when it's available, you can um, follow that little QR code down there with the dinosaur. Um, or just make sure you're on our listserv. Um, so we also have some courses on healthy knowledge. So if you go to healthyknowledge.org and put in the word policy, two of our courses will come up. An introduction to the power of policy and the 10 steps of policy change where you follow a South Park type coalition that works its way through the 10 steps. Oh, here's where you can join our listserv. So there is our email address and our website. And I think that's all I have. I'd like to thank um, Liz and Snigda and Michael for presenting today. And I need to save this whiteboard. So um, I'll keep the whiteboard up for now. I wanna make sure I capture what you said. Um, but everyone, this has been recorded. It'll be available on our YouTube page. Um, you'll be getting a certificate probably tomorrow in your email. Um, we look forward to seeing all of you in session two on October 27th. Have a great day.